All right, Alex, do you want to do any introductions or is it all on me? Go for it. Okay. Well, we have 20 participants, so I think we're going to start. Um, we're really very lucky, actually, to have such an expert on sexual medicine giving a review talk for the residents as they prepare for their in-service prep. So it's a real great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Mulhall, who is at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center um, and is the Director of Sexual and Reproductive Medicine Program. And I am really looking forward to learning something tonight. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Dr. Mulhall, and um, I will field any questions as they come up and let you know. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. It's my pleasure to be here. So um, I'm very happy to be here. I, I sit here not just as somebody who does sexual medicine day in, day out, but I actually sat on the uh, written exam committee. So I have uh, insider information. Uh, you probably know that in uh, on your exam, there is a specified number of questions in everything. There's a preset number of questions in anatomy, physiology, sexual medicine, infertility. Um, some of the anatomy questions and some of the physiology questions actually will look like sexual medicine questions because they're germane to the subject. But um, you're also aware that there's some test questions on there. So um, there is a definite incidence of sexual medicine on your exam. Okay, there's definitely going to be questions on there. Um, and it's actually one of the areas where there's um, black and white is pretty easy. Um, not a lot of questions on prostate cancer because it's hard to come up with large randomized controlled trials. So um, this is fairly easy stuff for you to perfect for the exam purposes. Let me just move this forward. Uh, okay, so here are the pointers. So uh, know the resources, know the anatomy and physiology, know drug pharmacokinetics and dynamics. And this is germane, not just to sexual medicine, but to every area in neurology. Know the mechanism of action of the drugs that you use, know the drug adverse events. Uh, the exams love to ask about adverse events. Know the role and limitations of various investigations. And then of course, no operative complications. Uh, these are the classic resources. Um, the guidelines are very important. When I sat on the exam committee, Campbell's was the thing, but they've really moved um, somewhat away from that and focusing more on guidelines and core curriculum. So know that stuff. Let's start by ED. Um, it, the anatomy is uh, easy to ask about. Um, this would not be considered a classic sexual medicine question, but it would be an anatomy question. The tunica albuginea is a bilayered structure, outer longitudinal, inner circular fibers, high tensile strength, with the lowest strength being at a five and seven o'clock. That's how urethral injury occurs during um, uh, urethral, um, uh, corporal dilation during implant surgery. Uh, the arterial inflow, pudendal artery, common penile artery, branches into the superficial dorsal artery and deep cavernosal artery. So it's possible there's a diagram that you might get, uh, which would have arrows and uh, the deep artery is the cavernosal, which is a rectal artery and the superficial is the dorsal. Venous outflow has four sources of drainage, uh, dorsal vein, spongiosal veins, both of which are on the shaft. Crural and cavernosal veins are not anywhere near the shaft. They are posterior to that. This is why um, constriction bands tend not to work very well in men who have true venous leak. The neural input is non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic, parasympathetic from S2 through 4. That's about as much anatomy as you really need to know in the sexual medicine arena. Um, this is, um, sounds like we got noise interference in the back there. This is a diagrammatic representation of uh, coming from Tom, beautiful article in New England Journal. And the key thing here is that the lacunar spaces are lined by endothelium surrounded by muscle. And that muscle is under alpha adrenergic control. That is how our penis stays flaccid during the day. It's under tonic contraction um, through adrenaline. Uh, when nitric oxide gets released into the penis, then the adrenaline is turned off and the muscle relaxes. The lacunar spaces go from small little narrow holes, Swiss cheese to very large lacunar spaces, decrease resistance to blood flow, uh, and they fill up with blood. And that is essentially it. As this muscle expands, what happens is these subtunical venules, if you can see my arrow here, get compressed between the smooth muscle and the tunica albuginea, and that is the vena occlusive mechanism. 
this kind of mystical vein um, a valve mechanism. That's how it works. It's just compression of the subtunical venules sitting outside the tunic albu inside the tunic albuginia, outside the smooth muscle. This is a very important slide. And of course, this is the mechanism by which PD5 inhibitors work. Nitric oxide gets released. There is an accumulation of cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP. Uh, there's a reduction in intracellular calcium, and that leads to smooth muscle relaxation. And that leads to penile tumescence. On the other side, you get adrenaline causing contraction of the smooth muscle, okay? And that results that because of uh, accumulation of uh, intracellular calcium within the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Medication associated ED, um, the two uh, antihypertensives that are most likely to cause this problem are diuretics, uh, loop diuretics. They, uh, the means by which uh, diuretics cause ED is generally believed to be through increased levels of angiotensin. Uh, beta blockers, um, alpha agonists are negative, um, uh, beta agonists are positive. If you block uh, the beta receptors, then theoretically, these are anti-erection or erectolytic Calcium channel blockers and central sympatholytics and ganglion blockers are much less likely to cause ED. And of course, they're much less commonly used these days. Um, Pro-erectile agents are ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, actually. So the sartans are pro-erectile, technically. Digoxin is a potent anti-erection chemical, erectolytic. It, is a, um, it causes a accumulation of calcium and, of course, smooth muscle contraction. That's what makes it such an excellent inotrope and chronotrope in the heart, and that's not good for erections. It's hard to parse out whether psychotropic medications are potent erectolytic agents or is it the underlying psychiatric disorder of which the men are on the medication, classically depression or anxiety, and both of which are associated with ED anti -antigens. and then of course, 5 alpha reductase inhibitors are well known to reduce libido and in some men, erectile dysfunction. This is the pathophysiology of uh, erectile dysfunction for radical prostatectomy, for prostate radiation, for diabetes, and actually also for men who have uh, pelvic fractures, who have, go a long periods of time without erections. Uh, the neural injury causes smooth muscle apoptosis, smooth muscle collagenization, causes endothelial damage, uh, vascular injury, whether it's atherosclerosis or endothelial dysfunction, is a negative for erections. And then, of course, the final common pathway to permanent ED in all of these uh, conditions is uh, smooth muscle collagenization. So when we talk about smooth muscle atrophy post-prostatectomy, what we're really talking about is uh, collagenization of smooth muscle. Um, really, the only test on here that you need to pay any attention to will be duplex Doppler ultrasonography. Penile, penile brachial index, office injection tests are historical tests. Dynamic infusion cavernosometry or cavernosography um, is also historical. Arterial, um, uh, arteriography is used very, very infrequently for those men who are potentially candidates for penile revascularization, which is very, very uncommon in routine urologic practice. This you do need to know. You do need to have a sense for what the normal values are for uh, inflow and outflow. Uh, they're not going to make it complicated for you. They're not going to give you somebody with a PSV of 29 or 31. They're going to make it quite clear, uh, somebody with a PSV uh, certainly over 35 or under 25, uh, make it very obvious for you. And diastolic velocities less than five centimeters per second are considered normal, anything above that. And again, they'll make it clear, probably an EDV of 10 plus uh, is consistent with venous leak. Um, during ultrasound, there is uh, complete smooth muscle relaxation if you give the men uh, enough medication. And then, of course, um, we need to be aware that patients might need reversal afterwards because of uh, paralysis of the smooth muscle. Uh, those three patterns you see at the bottom are worthwhile memorizing because you might, in fact, get a duplex Doppler ultrasound um, tracing like this. Normal on the left, high peak systolic velocity, negative end diastolic velocities, the only true indicator of complete smooth muscle relaxation. Then you have venous leak, you've got good inflow, and you have these very elevated end diastolic velocities. You can see my arrow there. And then mixed vascular disease where you've got decreased inflow and excessive outflow. I put neurological testing up here just so you know what they might be, but 
Uh, generally speaking, it is very unusual for a question like this to come up, but nocturnal penile tumescence and rigidity analysis is a very reasonable assessment of neural input. You would expect it to be flat in the early days post-radical prostatectomy, for example. Pudental EMG is a motor nerve assessment. Biophysiometry is a penile sensation test, and that is usually confirmed using somatosensory evoked potentials. Again, both of these are assessments of the penile sensory nerve, the dorsal nerve of the penis. And then this bottom test, corpus cavernosal EMG, never took hold in the United States of America, although it is used in Europe, but it's just not standardized. Um, this is something that's probably worth knowing. This is the Princeton Consensus Guidelines, and this is an assessment of the risk of men uh, uh, for um, cardiac problems during sexual activity, not just with a PD-5 inhibitor, but cardiac activity. And it's generally broken down into three groups. And I, I don't have a lot of information on what those, group, what those conditions are, but essentially the high risk patients are those who have hokum or have advanced congestive heart failure, uh, profound aortic stenosis. Um, the low risk patients are those patients who have excellent cardiac reserve. And generally speaking, this guideline suggests that if you are of indeterminate risk, that some evaluation of exercise reserve and cardiovascular reserve is important. And that would simply be a cardiac stress of some kind. This is the process of care model, um, which uh, the most recent uh, ED guidelines, which um, I doubt there will be questions relating to. If there are, there are probably test questions because it's only, only came out two years ago. But um, there is a little bit of difference between the uh, original ED guidelines and the most recent one in this regard. So ED pharmacotherapy, PD-5 inhibitors. So uh, the mechanism of action, this is important. Um, PD-5 inhibitors, of course, uh, inhibits PD-5. Uh, PD-5 is an uh, enzyme that degrades cyclic GMP, which is pro-erectile to an active form called GMP. So cyclic GMP is pro-erectile. PD-5 inhibitors are pro-erectile. PD-5 is anti-erection. Cyclic GMP is formed through the action of guanylate cyclase. Um, sometimes gu called guanylyl cyclase, but guanylate cyclase. And so that's a, that's a good enzyme to have. Uh, guanylate cyclase is activated by nitric oxide. And this is why PD-5 inhibitors don't work well in men who've got an autonomic neuropathy because they are unable to mount a nitric oxide or a nitrogic response. They just can't secrete nitric oxide, post-radical prostatectomy or cystectomy, diabetics with autonomic neuropathy. Nitric oxide is formed from L-arginine, which is a byproduct of citrulline. You need sexual stimulation to produce nitric oxide. That's why you can't go sit in the corner with the New York Times and get a great erection in response to Viagra or Cialis because you need sexual stimulation, cerebral and probably direct penile. Nitric oxide comes predominantly from the nerves, but also from the endothelium. The nerve, the neural nitric oxide triggers erection, but the maintenance of erection is mainly from sheer force induced endothelial nitric oxide secretion. Uh, this is worth remembering. Uh, these are the uh, four major PD-5 inhibitors. There are many others that are available outside of the United States. If you look at the time to maximum uh, absorption and the half-life, you'll see that Cialis stands out differently because it's slower absorbed, but has a much longer half-life. Uh, empty stomach for Vardenafil and Sildenafil, also true for Avanafil. The duration of action of sildenafil, vardenafil is about uh, four to eight hours. So um, we typically tell our patients that they have an eight hour window of opportunity. If you take it with food in the stomach, uh, you reduce the absorption by about 30%. You also double the time it takes to get absorbed. So normally no food, um, sildenafil takes about an hour to really kick into action, two hours with uh, food in the stomach, especially fatty food. Okay, so in the trials, the, uh, the fatty food was a, um, a large a Big Mac, uh, large shake and large fries, uh, McDonald's fries. Uh, there's no significant food effect for Tadalafil. Um, there is a food effect for Ravanafil, despite the fact that the label says that there isn't, but certainly our clinical experience is there is. The duration of action of uh, Tadalafil at Cialis is much longer lasting. Uh, it's, it's probably at least 24 hours. These drugs are believed to be erectogenic for two to three half-lives um, so 36 hours is not unreasonable duration of action to tell patients, for example. What about the precautions or contraindications? Well, nitrates, of course, are, are very important. We can add to that guanylate cyclase activators, which are used for pulmonary hypertension. Uh, the 2448 separation there is for Viagra, Levitra, and Stendra, okay? 
uh, 24 hour separation between the use of nitrates and the use of a, a PD5 inhibitor or vice versa. That uh, duration is 48 hours for uh, Tadalafil or Cialis. Protease inhibitors, particularly older generation protease inhibitors such as ritonavir and sequinavir, increase the CMAX by several fold, 200 to 300 percent. And while that has not translated any clinically meaningful issue, it is an excellent uh, fodder for a question uh, on the in-service. So just be aware of that. These are um, CYP34A uh, and 34 inhibitors, and therefore they allow the medication to hang around for a long period of time and accumulate to very high levels. The alpha blocker uh, issue is in the label, and the bottom line is that if you're using a quarter maximum dose of any PD-5 inhibitor, you do not need to worry about alpha blockers. However, if it's anything other than that, then you should separate the alpha blocker and the PD-5 inhibitor uh, by four hours because of the risk of hypotension. Uh, grapefruit juice, when uh, Viagra came out in April of uh, 1998, of course, so grapefruit juice prolongs the action of Viagra. We should all be drinking grapefruit juice to make sure our Viagra works longer. This is a theoretical concern and really does not translate into any clinically meaningful benefit. Uh, poor cardiac reserve, uh, not a board question, but um, certainly it's worth asking your clinical practice if you can walk up and down two flights of stairs briskly without chest pain. That's equivalent to a stage two in a modified Bruce protocol, which is a cardiac stress test. What are the side effects? The side effects are predominantly class effects. So if you take a 100 milligrams of Viagra or 20 milligrams of Cialis, the side effect rates are approximately 15% of men get headache, 10% get facial flushing, 7% get GI effects, predominantly heartburn, 4% get nasal congestion, and about 2% of men are going to get visual disturbances, except with Cialis, Tadalafil, there's a very low incidence of uh, visual side effects because it's got a very low affinity for PDE6, the retinal phototransduction enzyme. The side effects visually are usually diplopia, blurred vision, or chromatopsia, sometimes called cyanopsia, which is the alteration in color vision, the blue haze. Myalgia is typically a side effect reserved for long-acting PD5 inhibitors such as Cialis, and this is a result of venous pooling it used to be thought to be the result of PDE11 inhibition, but we now realize it's just venous pooling. What about intracavernosal injection therapy? This is important to know. This is real fodder for a question. PGE1, prostaglandin E1, is a cyclic AMP activator. Papaverine is a nonspecific PDE inhibitor. Phentolamine is an, an alpha blocker. And of course, if you're using bimix, which is papaverin and phentolamine, or if you're using trimix, which is all three of these, then of course, you can see the synergy between the different classes of drugs. Direct injection to corpus cavernosum. The, the corporal smooth muscle is a sensation very much like the heart. So you inject at the lower right-hand corner of the penis and uh, up at the top left-hand corner, within microseconds, you have uh, a change in a smooth muscle uh, activity. And injection at two o'clock and 10 o'clock positions and this bypasses the need for neural input. So many times patients will say, well, how come the injections work if the pills don't work in the early stages post prostatectomy? Because we are conning the muscle into thinking that the nerves are functioning. Uh, it's an only dependent on the, uh, the health of the corpus cavernosal smooth muscle. If your smooth muscle is healthy, by definition, you will be an injection responder. If you have collagenization of your smooth muscle and venous leak as a result of that, then you might not respond to injections. The precautions for injection therapy, priapism, of course. Um, that's not saying that in clinical practice we don't give men who have sickle cell disease injection therapy, but it's certainly a precaution. You need to be very careful, and again, fodder for a great um, board question, MAOI medications, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. The problem with MAOIs is not the vasoactive agent, but it's if you had to give the reversal medicine, if you had to give phenylephrine, then phenylephrine is a monoamine and there's no MAO to oxidize it, and therefore you have potential for malignant hypertension. So MAOIs are a contraindication to the use of intracavernosal injections because of the concern of phenylephrine cross-reactivity. Coagulopathy is a precaution, not a contraindication. Poor manual dexterity, poor vision, and then pay run disease. These are just precautions. They are not contraindications. Side effects, uh, priapism is a, the biggest complication, of course, uh, bruising, pain, PG1 hypersensitivity. This is indicative, again, good fodder for a question of uh, autonomic neuropathy. So if you have a patient who comes in to see you who had excellent nurse sparing, perfect grading of bilateral nurse sparing surgery, and you give them uh, intracavernosal trimix or PG1 monotherapy, and they have aching pain in their penis, by definition, 
one of those nerves is severely injured because of the prostaglandin E1 hypersensitivity. What about MUSE, medicated urethral system for erection? Okay, this is a suppository about the size of a grain of rice placed into the urethra. The risks again, are complications of priapism, very low rates of that. Urethral bleeding, very uncommon. Penile pain, this is a massive dose of PG1. So it's in four doses, 125, 250, uh, 500 and 1,000. We only ever use 1,000 micrograms. That's a big dose of prostaglandin. And if somebody has an autoeconomic neuropathy, then they will invariably have some degree of penile pain. It's plagued by inconsistent response and very low rates, but documented it's in the label of vaginal irritation. What about vacuum device therapy? Uh, the precautions, the contraindications, anticoagulation is, is a contraindication in our practice. Uh, it's not so much the vacuum that's the problem, it's the application of the constriction band and tearing of veins, which may cause real problems if the patient is anticoagulated. Poor penile sensation, forgetting the ring is on, spinal cord injured patients, for example, just be cautious of that. Poor cognitive function and severe Peyronie's disease where a very curved penis being placed into a, a straight chamber is problematic. What about penile implant surgery? I think you're all aware that there are different types. Uh, there's malleable, also known as non-inflatable or semi-rigid, two-piece inflatable without a reservoir, three-piece uh, with a reservoir. Reservoir location, space of retius or submuscular. Um, the submuscular can be done through a scrotal incision and, and through the inguinal ring. If you can't create a space in the space of retius behind the pubic bone, you can go cephalat and place it behind the rectus muscle there. Or if that access is problematic, you can go uh, cephalat and make an incision, a counter incision, um, uh, and you can place this subrectus um, around the level of the anterior superior iliac spine. Uh, infrapubic incision. The advantage of this, of course, is there's direct visualization of the external ring. It avoids the risk of scrotal hematoma. Um, however, you are um, at risk of injuring the dorsal nerves if you don't know what you're doing and difficulty reaching Carrera. So it's entirely possible. You might get a question of a patient coming in to see you six months post penile implant surgery who has penile sensation loss. And that would be a dorsal nerve injury at the time of an infrapubic incision. The scrotal incision doesn't uh, put the dorsal nerves at risk, but there's a higher instance of uh, a hematoma formation, um, but you've ready access to the Carrera if there's crural perforation. Complications, uh, infection rates in the, uh, you know, one to 5% range. Most people will say two to 3%. Um, do you explant them or salvage them? The board answer is still, if you have an infected implant, you take everything out and, um, and you come back on another day to fight the battle that you don't do salvage. Despite the fact in clinical practice, any experienced implant surgeon is certainly going to pitch uh, salvage surgery to, uh, to patients. But really what it appears to be an 85% success rate doing salvage. Mechanical malfunction rates are about 20% at 10 years. Um, most of these complications uh, are uh, pump uh, tubing blowouts and replacing the pump alone as possible. And there's no definite rule as to how long or how old an implant should be before you must replace it. Some of the older implant surgeons, John Mulcahy, Steve Wilson, uh, would typically have said that, you know, if it's a few years old, you should replace the entire implant. And that has been challenged uh, recently in more recent times, but uh, that's a judgment call. Crossover where you are dilating the left corpus cavernosum and you shift over through the fenestrated septum into the other side. Um, that's very easy uh, to recognize if you're paying attention. It's very easy to fix. Uh, it's not really anything that you need to be stressed about, but if you identify it, simply put a Hagar dilator up one of the corporal bodies and then put your first cylinder in on the other side so it cannot cross over. Urethral perforation from a board standpoint, stop the operation and come back and fight another day. Um, Crow perforation, you can fix that with a rear tip extender sling or using a, a windsock, using tutoplast. Uh, we've avoiding you avoid use non-biologic grafting material in associ association with implants now because of the risk of increased risk of infection. So um, just be aware of that. Missizing auto inflation, delayed erosion. Um, if you see a patient with erosion in the boards, it's almost certainly somebody who's got an infection. Uh, you don't need to worry too much about pressure necrosis. So intraoperative urethral perforation mandates termination. That's the board answer. Always look for retained rear tip extenders during explantation surgery. So you might get a question, for example, where a person has had an explant six weeks, eight weeks before and comes back with high fevers, elevated white blood cell count and pus draining. And the first thing you want to think about, did the surgeon get all the rear tip extenders out at the time of the um, prior explantation. 
any cellulitis or infection on the patient's body in the pre-op area mandates canceling the case. That remains uh, the answer on the board. So just be aware of these three things. They're all good fodder for a question. Let's switch to priapism. The board loves priapism because it's so black and white. Ischemic, also known as low flow or venoclusive corporal smooth muscle is paralyzed with the inability for the venoclusive mechanism to open with results in zero inflow and outflow. And non-ischemic, previously called high flow arterial, unregulated inflow resulting from a cavernous artery, cavernosal or a fistula, invariably the result of trauma to the penis or perineum. Okay, it doesn't have to be penile trauma at all. So the first one ischemic is smooth muscle paralysis. And the second one is just unregulated inflow. Ischemic priapism etiologies by far and away, the most common are the first four here. Intracavernosal injections, of course, and that of course deliberately paralyzes smooth muscle. Hopefully the dose of the medication used is such that priapism doesn't occur. Psychotropic medications through anticholinergic effects can cause smooth muscle paralysis. Cocaine is an interesting drug because it can actually cause priapism. And the means by which it does that is it depletes norepinephrine at the uh, neural end plate. That is a question that you might get asked. How does cocaine cause priapism? It depletes norepinephrine, the uh, contracting neurotransmitter uh, at the, uh, the uh, terminal plate of the nerve. And then hematologic malignancy is believed uh, through uh, hyperviscous blood, et cetera. So multiple myeloma, uh, leukemic crisis, et cetera, uh, causing problems. L uh, lipid uh, TPN, anticoagulant toxins, uh, you could, there are a hundred causes of pharmacologic um, uh, priapism, but the first four are probably the most important from the standpoint of the board. Uh, how do you differentiate ischemic? Uh, the penis is usually fully rigid. Uh, in non-ischemic, it's not. Uh, there's penile pain with ischemic. There is invariably no penile pain uh, with uh, non-ischemic. Uh, the penis is, in non-ischemic, is usually partially rigid in the five, four to six range on a 10-point scale, where six is just about good enough for penetration. The ischemic patients, of course, have an abnormal cavernosal blood gas. You get a, a phone call from the blood gas laboratory. The patient is dying with a uh, pH of 6.9 and a PCO2 that's high and a PO2 that's very low. And that is the direct opposite in patients with non-ischemic. Hematologic abnormalities do cause ischemic pri priapism and not non-ischemic. Recent ICI, uh, you can actually cause both types of recent ICI, uh, paralysis of the smooth muscle causing ischemic. But if you skewer the cavernosal artery, which is quite difficult to do with a uh, diabetic needle, then you may in fact get uh, non-ischemic priapism. Penile or perineal trauma is not a cause of ischemic priapism. It's a cause of non-ischemic priapism. Acute manage, all patients should have a cavernosal uh, blood gas. Um, if you're unable to get blood out of the corporal body, that person has had uh, priapism for quite some time and has edema and there's no blood in the lacuna spaces anymore. Um, whether you do a duplex Doppler ultrasound, that is not a, a board answer, but uh, from a practical standpoint, uh, you can do that. If there's no flow, then it's ischemic. And if there's excess flow, uh, then it's not ischemic. If you're going to do an ultrasound on a patient who comes into you, who you think has non-ischemic priapism, you want to make sure you ultrasound, not just the penis, but also the perineum. You can get a straddle injury causing a fistula in the perineum that you'll miss if you only do a, a penile ultrasound. Uh, these are not uh, board answers, but just some general practical guides, a kind of time-dependent approach if it's very early on. Just give intracavernosal uh, phenylephrine if it's later on than aspirating, et cetera, and potentially irrigating. Um, and if somebody comes in longer than 72 hours and they've had persistent priapism for that length of time, I would typically do nothing in them other than pain control because it is a generally unsalvageable. Probably need to know the names of these shunts. Uh, Ebba Hodge is a glandular shunt with an 11 blade at the coronal sulcus. The winter shunt used a true cut needle through the glands. Um, some of these other ones, the Algarab is what I would typically use myself. Uh, it's excising a five by five millimeter segment of tunica through a curvilinear incision on the glands. Uh, Tom Liu uh, popularized the, uh, the T shunt and then Bourbonnet came out with the snake procedure, which is actually very useful in men who've got very, very long periods of priapism. So this is putting down a small uh, bore uh, Hagar dilator through the Algarab or through your T shunt and uh, coring out a, um, a port channel uh, for a venous drainage. Uh, proximal shunts, we have really moved away from doing proximal shunts. If a good Algarab shunt 
with or without tunneling the snake maneuver doesn't work, then I have to tell you in my experience, none of these work very well. If you have muscle that is able, is healthy enough, then a shunt, a distal shunt should work. And uh, generally speaking, if the distal shunt doesn't work, it means that the muscle is irreparably damaged. Um, I would strongly encourage you to consent people before you start doing any reversal uh, of a priapism and talk to them right up front about anything we do, your priapism or anything we do might result in you having permanent erectile tissue damage. We always give our patients a penile block. We use a 19 gauge butterfly needle. I place it through the glands. If somebody has a rigid erection, you should be able to feel the corporal bodies just like they had a, a rigid penile implant sitting under in there. So it should be pretty easy to hit the corporal body through the glands. The big advantage of doing it through the glands and not through the side, through the corporal body, is you cannot get a hematoma if you do it through the glands. It's a kind of a mini winter shunt, right? Okay, if you put it on, I'm sure the senior residents all know this, if you put it through the side of the penis and it falls out and then the penis looks like the dog got at it the next day with uh, hematoma formation. Uh, we redose with phenylephrine every 10 to 15 minutes and after one hour of conservative therapy, we would shunt uh, contraindications to ap agonist therapy, as I mentioned earlier on, or monoamine oxidase inhibitors. This severely complicates um, uh, priapism reduction in these patients. Um, and then uh, post-shunt penile implant insertion. If you've done a distal shunt, especially if you've done an algorab and you've cored out um, a piece of tunica distally, just be very careful when you're doing your distal dilation a few months down the road. So for priapism, document accurately, including timing and dating of all records. I have uh, had several cases where I've defended urologists in priapism. And one of the things the lawyers go after is the timing. You may have seen the person four times in the space of a couple of hours, but if you don't document that you've done that date and time, then they don't know and we don't know when you saw the patient. So date and time, all records, even if it's just one or two lines, just date and time. Uh, obtain conformed percent before any surgical intervention, ensure an adequate trial of corporal aspiration and alpha agonists. Shunts must accomplish a wide fistula between spongiosum and cavernosum. Uh, we always start with the distal shunt. The purpose of a shunt is not to get rid of the erection. The purpose of the shunt is to oxygenate the penis, get new fresh blood flowing in there. So you may do a distal shunt that may be working perfectly. You may see bright red blood coming out, but the penile uh, rigidity may not drop very much. As long as the person has blood flow and oxygenation, then it's okay. So for, if you get called to the recovery room or to the floor four or six hours later, Mr. Jones is still rigid, okay? If you have a Doppler ultrasound at the bedside and you can document inflow, that's good, or just do a blood gas and show that it's oxygenated. And that's all you need to do. Uh, conduct serial post-operative examinations to define shunt patency, perform repeat shunt, proximal if patency cannot be established. Uh, we've avoided doing that in more recent years, to be honest with you, and follow up with patient on erectile function outcomes. And if you go more than 12 hours and certainly more than 24 hours, almost certainly you're gonna be left with significant collagenization of the smooth muscle. Evaluation of non-ischemic priapism. Uh, there are two messes, but not rigid. Uh, they've got a perfectly normal blood gas, looks perfectly healthy, high O2, low CO2, and normal pH. And then uh, if you use color uh, duplex Doppler, you should see an area of turbulence. You'll see a fissure on the penis or the perineum. And if you do an angiogram, uh, then you'll see blush. We don't do angiograms unless we are going to um, uh, embolize them. Corporal aspiration only has a diagnostic role. There's no role for phenylephrine. It's quite impressive to me how many I've seen in, many in the last few years who have been given uh, emergency room intracavernosal phenylephrine when it was crystal clear based on their blood gas that they had non-ischemic priapism. Initial management is observation. Give the fistula a time period to uh, resolve. Many of them do. Um, embolization may be performed at the request of the patient, but should be preceded by discussion of the chances for spontaneous resolution, risk of treatment related ED, and lack of consequences expected from delaying interventions. There's no harm for delaying this for a month. And if it's not resolved within a month, then you can go in and you can embolize. Always start with something that's absorbable, clot, gel foam. And if that doesn't work, then go back in and do coils. And coils that migrate cause ED. Stuttering priapism is a historical term. It's a, it's a very descriptive term, but really just refers to patients who either have a hematologic uh, related priapism that occurs and recurs, and that's typically sickle cell disease, or men with recurrent idiopathic priapism, uh, which have very different mechanisms. 
um, treat like ischemic priapism. Uh, sicklers only get priapism when they're cyclic. Um, the old concept where call hematology, two o'clock in the morning, start plasmapheresis, oxygen, alkalization, hydration is an old concept. You treat this patient, the sickler who comes in with priapism, just the same way as you do an intracavernosal injection induced priapism. You can call the hematologist and they will likely see the patient the next day and they'll get the sickle cell disease under control because that's the cause of the priapism. Recurrent idiopathic priapism is a fascinating uh, condition that Bud Burnett's done some beautiful work on. And the general concept is that there's dysregulation of the PDE5 enzyme, that they have an, uh, an underactive PDE5 enzyme. So they're incapable of turning off that smooth muscle relaxation arc. Peyronie's disease, um, we're going to go through the guidelines here. Clinicians should document the signs and symptoms. These are guidelines. Minimum requirements are careful history and physical examination. Clinicians should do an intracavernosal test or a duplex Doppler ultrasound to quantify the magnitude of the curvature. So relying on the patient on about 30 degrees is not good enough if you're going to treat the patient. Only clinicians with experience and diagnostic tools to appropriately evaluate, counsel, and treat the condition should treat PD. Um, you can see that a lot of these are clinical principles and expert opinions. Why? There is a complete absence of randomized controlled trial data. So coming up with strong recommendations in PD is very difficult. This is the uh, treatment algorithm. You can see it starts up on the top left there with history and physical, uh, what you should be. Um, and by the way, uh, you really should look at all the guidelines um, and you should at least look at the algorithms on the guidelines there because um, a lot of the questions will come out of the guidelines now. Patient counseling, uh, patients have stable disease, uh, desires invasive treatment, then you can do a, a curvature assessment. Patient has active disease, desires treatment of pain, then you can offer NSAIDs. Um, conditional recommendation, if adequate pain control with oral medications uh, is not good, then uh, you can offer shockwave therapy. This is not shockwave therapy that's used for erectile dysfunction as you see advertised, this is different. Um, it's rarely used in the United States of America. There are three large randomized control trials in Europe showing no benefit to deformity resolution with shockwave therapy. Moderate recommendations on the top left-hand corner here is that you can offer Zyaflex, intralesional collagenase clostridium histolyticum uh, with modeling. And the patients are there. Very important, this is again fodder for a good question, will be it's appropriate for men with greater than 30 and less than 90 degrees of curvature. Um, you can also offer intralesional interferon, although that, uh, the role for that has dropped, intron A has dropped dramatically. Conditional recommendation to offer intralesional parathomol, that too has almost certainly died. Remember, uh, Zyaflex is um, approved, label is approved for stable PD, okay? Increasingly, physicians are using it for unstable early stage disease, although that is not on the label and there isn't a large amount of data uh, supporting that, although it's used. Uh, pharmacotherapy, this is definitely something you want to memorize. Uh, pharmacotherapy side effects, colchicine can be associated with a very rare, less than 1% instance of gray granulocytosis. So theoretically, you have a man with Peyronie's disease comes in six months later with a white blood cell count less than uh, one, then a granulocytosis, and that will be colchicine. What med is he on, colchicine? Uh, potaba, potassium, paramino, benzoate. Cause, again, benzoate causes GI side effects, particularly diarrhea. Pentoxifylin very uncommonly causes GI side effects. PD-5 inhibitors, the usual side effects. If somebody's using PD-5 inhibitors for PD, there's no good data in humans that this is of any significant benefit from a deformity uh, resolution standpoint. Tamoxifen, hot flashes, loss of libido and erectile dysfunction. Uh, Zyaflex, ecchymosis, hematoma, fracture. And verapamil, ecchymosis, hematoma, and dizziness, it being a calcium channel blocker. Surgical management, um, this is probably worth um, memorizing. Um, patient has intact erectile function with or without pharmacotherapy and or vacuum device therapy, offer tunical plication or plaque incision and grafting. Um, and then for the patient who's got PD and ED, uh, probably the best way to approach them is to place a penile implant. Uh, penile plication complications, uh, urethral injury, that should be incredibly rare. If you're doing plication on the ventral aspect for dorsal curvature, um, it would really be a surgical misadventure if you uh, injure the urethra. If you're doing a dorsal plication for a neurovascular bundle and you're placing your sutures uh, either in the uh, bed of the deep dorsal vein or if you're doing it outside of the nerves at like a two and 10 o'clock position, 
uh, you really should be wearing loop magnification uh, to make sure that you don't injure the neurovascular bundles. Uh, those ner that nerve injury will cause, um, cause anesthesia of the penis. Failure to correct deformity is very unusual in the modern era when we're using kind of imbrication type procedures where you can put a suture in, take it out, reposition it, et cetera. Suture granuloma, uncommon. Um, patients will feel the knots for application uh, if it's non-absorbable suture, which is typically what I would use uh, in the flaccid aspect, but not so much in the erect state. Skin necrosis. If you're doing a circumcising incision in an uncircumcised male, be very careful of distal uh, lymphedema of the foreskin or skin necrosis. And ED, really, if you do not make an incision in the tunic albuginia, if you're just doing an imbrication procedure like the Lou eight dot technique, then there should be zero ED. And if somebody comes in with ED post plication, they most probably have non-organic erectile problems. Plaque incision grafting, this is an operation that you, to which you can really hurt somebody. Um, if you're doing elevation of the neurovascular bundle, which you'll have to do, then uh, you, there's about a 10% incidence of uh, um, penile sensation loss at six months after surgery, which typically resolves. But we've certainly seen people with permanent anesthesia of their distal penis from nerve injury. Failure to correct deformity, and again, the skin necrosis if you were doing a circumcising incision in an uncircumcised male. The biggest issue with plaque incision grafting is the development of erectile dysfunction. If you take a, even a young man with perfectly normal erectile function, it is possible, depending on the degree of curvature, the size of your graft, um, to cause erectile tissue uh, damage underneath the graft, and they'll end up getting erectile dysfunction, which is predominantly uh, collagenization of smooth muscle and venous leak. Um, penile implant surgery in men with peyronie's disease, typically reserved for men who've got peyronie's disease and ED, that's non-responsive to pharmacotherapy, or for patients with very complex deformities. Um, so men with uh, profound hourglass deformities, um, they may be better off uh, having penile implant surgery. Uh, you're probably best choosing an inflatable implant. Um, the literature on malleable implants in peyronie's disease is fairly sparse, although my name is on one of those papers suggesting it's okay but I think you're going to do better with uh, girth enhancement and stabilization of the, um, the hinge penis uh, with an inflatable implant. Just remember from a clinical standpoint, dilation is much more complicated. Uh, the plaque, for example, can drive you immediately and through the weakest portion of the tunica albuginia at five and seven o'clock and you get urethral perforation. This is something that you absolutely need to know. The maneuvers that are required, if you have residual deformity, generally described as more than 30 degrees after insertion of your implant, full inflation, and there's residual deformity. The first step is modeling, also called molding, uh, then plaque incision, and then plaque incision, and potentially grafting. And of course, the usual complications for penile implant surgery. Uh, we have very few uh, slides left. Um, uh, ejaculation is also um, a, a thing that's readily, it's easy to generate a question. Uh, ejaculation is a reflex uh, interplay between somatic, sympathetic, and parasympathetic pathways. Uh, serotonin is the pr primary neurotransmitter. Antigrade ejaculation is composed of two parts, emission of semen into the prostatic urethra and expulsion uh, outwards through the meatus. Emission is a sympathetic spinal cord reflex. Expulsion is combined action of sympathetic and somatic pathways, the contraction of those periurethral muscles, the bulbospongiosis in particular. Orgasm is entirely different. This is a, a pleasurable sensation associated uh, with uh, due to cerebral processing uh, related to increased pressure in the posterior urethra, we believe. The first part of the ejaculate comes from the bulbo urethral glands, uh, Capra's glands. The main fraction of the ejaculate is contributed by the epididymis and vas deferens along with prostate and seminal vesicles. Only 5% of semen uh, is a sperm, comes from the vas deferens. The vast majority comes from the seminal vesicles, which gives the semen its alkalinity, and the bulk of the remainder comes from the prostate. Sensory stimulation of the dorsal penile nerve and posterior urethral distension triggered an ejaculatory response. Emission of seminal fluid controlled by sympathetic nervous system activates contraction of the smooth muscle of the prostate, vasodeferentia, and seminal vesicles. The pudental nerve is responsible for the expungal phase of the ejaculate, the bulbospongiosis, that rhythmic contraction of the periurethral musculature that causes an antegrade ejaculate. If you have an RPLMD and you have sympathetic nerve injury, you can end up with one of two problems. You'll have failure to ejaculate, either called an ejaculation or the infertility guideline that has just come out, causes it, it calls it aspermia. And that might be retrograde ejaculation, which is very easy to understand. The semen is got, taking the pathway of least resistance to an open bladder neck because of uh, sympathetic nerve fiber injury into the bladder. 
and that's easy to diagnose with a retrograde semen analysis. More profound nerve injury causes failure of emission, where the semen doesn't even make it into the prostatic urethra. Uh, the former, retrograde ejaculation, is highly alpha, alpha agonist, excuse me, pseudofed, pseudofedrine responsive, and failure of emission is very poor, mo most likely not to respond to alpha agonist therapy. Um, there might be a question on definitions. The modern definition of PE is the International Society of Sexual Medicine ejaculation with a, with a, within about a minute, inability to, to delay ejaculation on all or nearly all vaginal penetrations with negative personal consequences, personal or, or, um, or um, couple. Um, the side effects of the drugs, clomipramine, fluoxetine, paroxetine, sertraline, tapoxetine, which is not used in the United States of America, I doubt you get asked a question for a drug that's not approved in this country, or tramadol. Uh, I do not use tramadol because of the low but very distinct risk of, of um, habituate or being a uh, habit-forming drug. Um, it's worthwhile knowing the side effects of, of these medications if you're using them. And that's the last slide. We're at about, I think, 54 minutes. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you have for the last couple of minutes or so. Thank you. If anyone wants uh, to post questions in the chat, I'd be glad to pass them along. That was really a very thorough and amazing talk. Um, I do pediatrics, so I've forgotten most of that. Um, although I did train under Dr. Melvin, so I learned some of it at some point in time. <laughs> sure you did from Arnold, yes. If there are any questions at another time, yeah, feel free to just send me an email. I'm very happy to, to respond to you. And um, I think if there are no questions, I good luck uh, on your exam. And uh... Alex passed uh, put a, um, a comment in the chat from the New York section saying, thank you for such a high yield talk for both in-service and boards. We're really very lucky to have this information and it will be posted on YouTube. Um, so for those residents who couldn't attend tonight, they'll still be able to uh, get those pearls of wisdom from such an expert. Um, I can't thank you enough for your time and this amazing